Welcome to the Corlin Economics Report, a weekly look at financial and political topics relating to asset-based investing. Guests on this program pay no fees to appear, and guests and hosts disclose any equity interest in companies profiled. Now, the Corlin Economics Report. Hey, everyone. Welcome in to the weekend edition of the KE Report. Corey Fleck here, your host for these first couple segments. We will have Shad back with us in the back half of this show. And boy, oh boy, there's a lot for us to talk about this week because of the fact that, look, we all knew that this week was more data heavy and central bank heavy, but I don't think a whole lot of us expected the pivot that we got out of the Fed and the pivot party that followed through for the markets. It's a very interesting time for markets to recap what happened on the back of the Fed statement, even more so Jerome Powell's press conference, but also what some of the other central banks did. Uh, In the first half of the show, I'm going to be chatting with Mark Chandler, managing partner at Bannockburn Global Forex, to focus on what the Fed did and what the implications could be throughout, not just next year, but the next couple of years. And in the last half of the show, we're going to be focused more on the resource sector for all of you investors, especially in the stocks. Now, as I mentioned, I'm chatting with Mark Chandler. Mark, I have to give you credit. I read over your website, mark2market.com, every week and almost every day. And the day before, for the Fed meeting on Wednesday. So on Tuesday, the headline article that you put out outlined the fact that we could see a Fed pivot just based on some of the inflation data that we saw earlier in the week. You're one of the few that was truly on board with this that hadn't been on board, let's say, before the this meeting or even in the last this whole last year. So Mark, I got to ask you, what caused this? What caused the Fed to pivot in your eyes? Yeah, thanks, Corey. I've, sometimes, you know, it's, uh, they say better to be lucky than smart. And I think it was just a question of uh, trying to connect these dots. And I I had thought that that the Federal Reserve was pushing in this direction. That is the direction. I would put it like this. Two times you stand pat, that's a pause. You stand pat three times, that's a halt. And I think that the even the hawks and the Fed, like uh, Governor Waller, had seemed to be content with being patient, just standing pat. And I thought that that would signal the end of a tightening cycle, which is quite remarkable. Before the Fed tightened, the market was was sort of upset uh, that they're critical of it because they thought they should have the Fed should have ended QE earlier, should have raised rates earlier. So we get this, uh, but the Federal Reserve, of course, at the time, like many of us, including myself, thought well, inflation is just transitory. And uh, lo and behold, inflation gets uh, higher than people thought, quicker than people thought. And now it's uh, all these other reasons, globalization, de-dollarization, higher oil prices. We came out with all these stories about why inflation is going to stay high and why it was structural. And yet it's begun falling. And so I, I and I also thought that behind the, behind the Fed's decision to pause for the third time, meaning it's going to be done, was the fact that Q3 growth over 5% unsustainable. And I was looking at relative sharp decline in activity here in Q4. And I thought if someone like me could see it coming, I think that the Fed would see it as well. And I think that that's the striking thing about the Fed statement. Despite the dramatic response, the Fed statement barely changed. What it changed was its assessment of the economy and said that the economy is growth activity is slowing from a strong pace in Q3. And they said that uh, inflation has eased over the past year. They recognized that inflation had fallen over the past year. That's a new phrase, has eased over the past year, but remains elevated, a repeat of what they said before. They also added one other sentence, that, uh, one other word, actually, and rested a whole statement. One word that also softened their stance, made it a little bit more dovish. And that is, they said, in determining the extent of additional policy firming. That's what they said before. In determining the extent of additional policy firming, this time they inserted the word any. Sounds kind of small, like we're really like uh, nitpicking here. But this is the kind of, uh, when people want to try to understand the Fed and get into like Fed speak and Fed thinking, you really have to take every I have to assume that every word 
has conveyed some meaning. And by modifying additional policy, by saying any additional policy, it softens it, meaning that the Federal Reserve also thinks it's done. I think that what surprised me from the Federal Reserve statement and Powell was that up until now, the soft landing view, which is you can get inflation back down towards target without causing a recession or without triggering a sharp rise in unemployment. And I think the Fed had been hopeful. Of course, policymakers, investors, everybody seemed to be hopeful of a soft landing. But this particular statement and this particular press conference, I think, was the most uh, most passionate, full-throated embrace that the soft landing is here. And Powell made a comment during the press conference where he acknowledged that they, that the Fed saw the risk of being too high for too long and that they were going to work against that. So in order to get a soft landing, it's not only good enough, it's not only sufficient to raise rates, shrink the balance sheet, but you also have to be quick in turning because of the lag time. If the Fed were to wait too long, and then they'd be stuck with the recession and they'd be blamed for it. Well, Mark, this all ties into the Fed's projections here in this sweet spot that it sounds like they're looking at here when it comes to inflation. And that is clearly their main focus and how they're conducting interest rates, what they're doing with interest rates over the next, I think it's two to three years. The Fed is projecting that inflation continues to grind down to around that 2% target. And it sounded to me like that was Powell's reason that the Fed would keep cutting rates because they're following inflation. It almost seems like their sweet spot is, again, that 2% inflation level and the Fed funds rate right around, let's say, two and a half. Is that really the dream scenario that the Fed is looking for? I, I think it is. I think that's becoming so rather than being like uh, I think Powell talked about how the, the path, a narrow path to soft landing. And I think the Fed feels more comfortable that the path is widened out, making it more likely. And so, yes, I, th- I think that the, with a couple of points I'd make about the Fed's, uh, Fed's new fo- uh, forecasts. One is that they are recognizing that inflation is going to continue to fall, but it's going to take till 2026 to get back to 2%. Before we get back to 2%, though, the Fed's going to begin cutting rates. They anticipate cutting rates. They think that as the latest dot plot shows scope for three rate cuts next year, the market is pricing in, it looks to me like the market is pricing in the better part of five to six rate cuts by the end of next year, which seems to me to be very aggressive. But here's what a lot of people, I think, miss, especially those who do not have this luxury that, and this, uh, this privilege that I have of just being able to like, spend my days uh, watching the markets intensely and, and going over these Fed comments and statements like with a fine-tooth comb. And what that I fully appreciate, I think, from the outside of this, of like the church, if you will, the, uh, the Federal Reserve and the Fed followers and everything. And what, I think what the Fed is focused on would be something like this, that what they think, what the part of the interest rates that affect the economy most directly, they would say, is not the nominal rate that you see, that you have on your credit card, that your bank pays you on your savings. But the key rate for them is what's called the real rate, inflation-adjusted rate. And so as inflation, if we keep the nominal rate the same, the same target, five and a quarter to five and a half, and inflation falls from, say, 6% to 4% or to 3%, the real rate is rising And so the Federal Reserve, I think, thinks that the way they're going to suggest what's going to happen in the first few cuts are not really going to be easing policy. The first few rate cuts will be to maintain the current level of restriction. That is to prevent the level of restrictions from doing from rising too much. We need a restrictive policy. Core CPI is four percent, so we need a restrictive policy. But as inflation falls, policy is becoming res- more restrictive. It's sort of like maybe people are familiar with the options market that you're you're long you're long an option, uh, say an at the money option. As the stock moves or the stock or the commodity moves in your favor, you are getting longer and longer, right? Your your delta goes from say 0.5 at the money until it's very deep in the money, and that's almost a 1.0 delta. How much right, the, the option moves for the underlying stock? And that's really what happens with interest rates. As inflation falls, real interest rates are rising. And so what the Federal Reserve will say is that they have to reduce nominal interest rates, cut the Fed funds target, so that 
the real rate stays the same. Restrictive, but not overly so, risking a recession. All right, Mark, we do need to carry this over to the markets because, look, it was a pivot party that almost all sectors were doing well. We saw big rotation in the small caps, commodities, precious metals did well, energy did well. The only loser was really the U.S. dollar. Even bonds got to buy as we saw yields continue to move down. The 10-year move under 4%. Big question is, is this going to continue? Because the markets are ending the week on kind of their back foot, but it's still going to be a good week for markets. And we did have uh, Fed had Williams pushing back on Friday, trying to clarify, actually saying almost the exact opposite of what Powell said in terms of, hey, there still might be a rate hike. Uh, we don't need to talk about rate cuts yet. It didn't seem to have the same impact on the markets as Powell's comments. What do you think about this pivot party and just how bullish everybody seems to be? I think for the important thing I think about this uh, about this pivot is it's not just the Federal Reserve. I'd say the, the interesting thing is that several other central banks met this week, and it seems like everybody acknowledges that even though there's some risk that they raise rates, they're going to keep that play that up. I think on balance, everybody thinks the ECB is done, the Bank of England is done, the Swiss National Bank is done, and this week Norway was the only central bank to hike interest rates, and they're done. Yeah. And so uh, I, I think that we're at the end of the post-COVID monetary tightening cycle that was not just in the U.S., but global. So we've got a global reduction in interest rates. And I, I think that what, what how the markets responded was it turns out that the rise in interest rates was a, was a bigger weight on equity markets than maybe people thought. Uh, not only in the U.S. making, say, some of the indexes, some of the measures near record highs. But the same thing is true in uh, Japan. Same thing is true in Europe. Very strong stock market rally, despite weak economies. It's really the falling interest rates as a driver. I'm concerned that what Williams said uh, today, trying to push back, is, 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 it's not, I don't think that anything that I heard from Powell did not say that there was a 100% chance that the Fed would cut rates in March. And yet that that is what the market is pricing in. Even now, after Williams, the market's pricing in about an 80, 85 percent chance of a hike in March. That does not seem to be a I, I can't blame the Fed for that. I don't think there's anything that the Fed said to make it sound like a rate cut was imminent. So I am concerned then that the pushback will be more serious. And, and think about what's happened this week. The U.S. reported stronger than expected retail sales. We did get the bounce back. Uh, in uh, industrial production manufacturing and back months were revised a bit lower. So, so the jury's still out perhaps, but what I'm looking at is shortly after we get out, we come back from new year's, the U S will report the next jobs data for this month, December. And the early call is for about 160,000. Yes. It's, it's slow. And maybe another t- a tick up uh, in unemployment, recouping a little bit of what it fell before. So I just don't think the economy is rolling into the kind of state they would get the Fed to cut rates in Q1. And I think that's that's what Williams is telling us. And so to me, what that means for the market is that we should expect that this has been a bit of an exaggerated move on interest rates. Uh, maybe the, the 10-year, we should expect to go back above 4%. Uh, maybe it's four and a quarter. The two-year has fallen roughly 80 basis points in the last two months. That also pre- seems a bit excessive. And so as interest rates back up, I think the dollar might get a bit of traction. It may bounce as well. And I think that that'll weigh on the stock market. But are these just going to be short term moves? Because even if the 10 year moves to, let's say, four and a quarter, that's still a long way off of 5% that we were staring at just a couple of months ago. And the dollar, it moved down drastically. Yeah, it bounced at the end of the week, but it's still in the 102 region. If we do get at least a little, I guess, turn in this pretty aggressive trend higher that we've seen for many markets would that just be short-term weakness and what seems like longer-term uptrends yeah i i I think that's what more or less what it's going to be we've had this such a strong move and you know less than a month ago the 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 narrative what i'd say was the consensus or uh the conventional narrative from wall street was that the bond vigilantes were going to make a stand in the face of a larger endless u.s budget deficit all the supply the bond vigilantes had had their fill and instead we've gone the exact opposite way and so sharply i think it's just begging uh for like uh top pickers those bond vigilantes who got their fingers burned uh try to make another stand 
Okay, so it, it does sound like a more bullish outlook than here. W- what could turn this around then? Would it simply be higher inflation data, simply because that's what the Fed seems so focused on? Or would it be weaker economic data, although it sounds like the Fed is already expecting that? So the risk to this, right? Despite like, like all these great minds focused on the markets and everything and how few, no one really predicts things for, you know, it's, just, it's very difficult. Maybe it's like Yogi Berra. It's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And so the uh, the range of possibilities, and I, I look at, at the end of the year, I look at where people thought, you know, consensus views, uh, medians and surveys, where people thought things were going to end this year. And we, very rarely are we close. And I often think when the consensus is close, it's because it's lucky rather than like smart about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that we should expect a, sh- a short-term move, but I think that the, in the bigger picture, uh, I think what's going to happen is we, sh- we shouldn't expect really good news from Europe, the UK, that is, the EU, anytime soon. Maybe not until late next year, at the earliest. Uh, Japan is struggling. You see this, despite having a, a currency that's about 50% undervalued by some purchasing power parity metrics, the Japanese manufacturing sector is still contracting. We just had that PMI flash PMI for December, the manufacturing sector is still contracting. And so I think that we should expect a relative slow growth next year, maybe not a recession in the U.S. And that's the other thing, you know, we, we haven't talked about it. Next year, 2024, over half the world is going to go vote. Uh, mostly it's a national elections, but there's a bunch of local elections too. We begin off the year, a key one would be in Taiwan, but not only do we have the U.S. election, EU parliamentary elections, India has elections. So we basically a lot of elections. And I already think that the shadow of the elections is beginning to hang over the markets. And so I'm looking at what happens during the fourth year of a presidential term in the U.S. So what happens the year of the U.S. election? Very rarely does the stock market go down. So that's a regularity. It's not like a law. It's not like it must be the case. But it just gives me a small bias that we probably should not I expect a big sell-off in stocks next year. That it could be uh, that seasonally or cyclically small up year. And what does it mean about the uh, uh, Fed policy? I think that Fed policy, we've seen the Fed change rates. A lot of people have this in their head that the Fed can't change rates too close to the elections. And yet when you really look at the historical record, Fed does rate, has changed rates, adjusted policy in September ahead of a November election, and it's, it's adjusted policy in November after the elections, and that's what could happen this year. Uh, we have the uh, we have a September FOMC meeting, we do not have one in October, and then we have one again a couple of days after the election. So if it doesn't necessarily affect the pace or what the Fed's going to do, they can they've done it. The historical record shows they've done adjustments within that framework. Uh, the other economic regularity, I think, is that very rarely does the economy contract in the fourth year of a presidential term. So I'm thinking that uh, the U.S. economy grows below trend, which the Federal Reserve, for the Federal Reserve trend growth means non-inflationary growth level, which they say is about 1.8%. And I think for most of the year, we'll grow below that. And then I think that we get the recession when everybody gives up on it for being wrong for a couple of years. It comes in 2025 when whoever's in the White House for, you know that that new president has to deal with it. Oh, how many times have we seen that though? Hey, the new president, the recession gets pushed off onto them, and well, it's going to be a pretty nasty year, I think, anyway, with all these elections going on, especially in the U.S. Let's talk currencies and let's also talk gold then, because look, uh, there's no denying that the U.S. dollar got crushed on the back of the Wednesday statement and press conference. Gold did really well. Some of the gold stocks, especially the majors, did really well. What stood out to you in terms of any currency moves and with gold, please? Yeah, sure. Let's begin with gold. You know, for me, a lot of people you've talked to, Corey, probably tell you that uh, the reason gold is high, the big buyer has been central banks. And people say this is dollar, the dollar, de-dollarization, all that. But I don't know if I really buy that as de-dollarization, partly because some of the biggest Central banks buying gold are allies of America's, like Singapore, Poland. China is buying gold. But when you think about that, they have $3 trillion of reserves. The amount of gold they're buying, we're talking about single percentage point changes. So I, I don't see it like that. I, I tend to think about gold the way I do, similar with currencies. If you tell me the direction of the dollar, 
and the direction of U.S. interest rates, I have a good idea, not always right, but a good idea of where gold's going. So the, the big rally we had in gold, that had been Wednesday and Thursday, I think, was because of a big drop in interest rates, big drop in the dollar, buy gold. But if I'm right about a pushback against these low interest rates that the market's getting, the, the central banks don't want the market to ease for them so early. If they don't really want to ease rates, to say even if they want to ease rates in March, by the market doing it now, it really, it really like could be self-defeating, could fuel the exact inflation that central banks thought they started to put that genie back in the bottle. So I think that gold comes back down and test those recent lows, call it 1975 or so. That 200-day moving average spot gold is about 1955. And that's what my level has been about 1950 as a reasonable buying opportunity if you think that gold is going to go higher as interest rates around the world begin falling sometime next year. Currencies, different On story. that point, sorry, Mark, on that point, though, that is still long-term bullish gold then, right? Because if all central banks are going into an easing scenario, even if markets do well, it does look like gold can do well on the back of that as well. Exactly. So in the big picture, I think that the dollar topped out, uh, not this year, but really late last year, September, October. Remember sterling down at 103 to the dollar, a record low. A euro is around 96 cents, extremely low. And purchasing power parity basis, they're just like unreasonably cheap. So I think the dollar topped out then. Uh, it's been a challenge this year because of the a year of two halves. The uh, first half of the year, the dollar was relatively soft. Dollar top uh, bottoms out in mid-July. It's had a good uh, second half of the year until more recently. So I yeah I fully agree that uh, looking out to through 2024, uh, I'd say lower interest rates, a broadly weaker dollar could help lift gold. And to really retest that high we saw earlier this month at 2135, that seems to be like the uh, reasonable target and still gives you uh, like a 5%, a little bit better than a T-bill type of return on a relatively low vol instrument. Currencies, uh, I'd say, you know, it's part of the whole story. I mean, part of the reason I have gold uh, strengthening in the big picture is partly because of a weaker U.S. dollar. I'd say that, you know, with all these other central banks meeting, a noteworthy thing is that while Powell and the Federal Reserve are going to continue to let the balance sheet unwind at roughly a $95 billion a month pace. They haven't said when they're going to stop that. Many people in the market think it's going to be finished uh, by the end of the first half. But it's interesting what the ECB did. So they first pushed against the idea of a rate cut. Market really didn't fully buy that. But what they did say was they were going to accelerate their balance sheet unwind in the first half of next year. They had this program that they were buying bonds under called the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program. And so they're not buying any more bonds there, but they're, re they're reinvesting the maturing proceeds. Well, they're going to reduce the amount of proceeds that they recycle until the end of next year when they do none. So at the end of so end of next year they stop recycling you know stop recycling all of it, so that seemed to be a more hawkish message, and the euro got a little bit above one ten, and today we had a very poor PMI readings from Europe. Many of the economists had expected an improvement, uh, but we saw it go the other way. For example, the eurozone composite fell to forty seven point zero down from 47.6. So bottom line here, weaker Eurozone economies got the market to shrug off uh, the, the real pushback from uh, Lagarde and the tightening of uh, the reduction of the balance sheet and have taken the Euro back through 109 here. So it's a full cent off of the highs. And I think we see some follow through selling next week. Uh, the big story, I think next week, people are going to be focusing on, even though it's the holidays, getting ready for them is the BOJ last meeting of the year. Uh, that's what's given us some volatility in the yen. The market had thought it gets spooked. It sort of scares itself sometimes, uh, thinking that the BOJ was going to exit. Uh, it's if you remember minus 10 basis points overnight interest rates. And a case can be made for them to exit their policies. But uh, most likely, they're going to continue with them. And for me, the key here is that when would we want a central bank to adjust, whether it's a target or adjust policy, not when they're under pressure and have to. Right now, with the JGB yields falling back off, uh, they're about 25 basis points off their recent highs. The strength, the recovery of the yen gives the Bank of Japan, it takes away the urgency for them to move. But that's why exactly they can move without being as disruptive. But I talked to Japanese officials and they tell me that's simply not the Japanese way. So best guess is that the Japanese do nothing. Backing up of U.S. interest rates helps give the dollar uh, support against the yen. And maybe we can go back up towards 145 or so.
All right, Mark. Thank you very much. I think that brings us up to speed on how you see uh, the markets playing out through not only just next year, but into the following year and the significance behind what the Fed did this week, as well as how it plays into other central bank policies. Sounds like next year is going to be a year of gradual easing from central banks. And we'll see just if the markets continue to party on. But boy, oh boy, it's even on the weakness to end the week. It's been a very strong week and a very strong month and a half now. Mark, thank you very much for your time. Hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Everyone, stick around. I'm going to be right back with a bit more of a focus on the resource stock side of things. Thanks, Corey. Good luck, everybody. Happy holidays. Al Corlin's firm, A.B. Corlin and Associates Incorporated, provides consulting services to public companies on matters of regulatory compliance. To find out more, follow the link from www.kereport.com. The Corlin Economics Report will be back after this brief timeout. Providing unique reporting on markets and companies since 1990. This is the Corlin Economics Report. All right, welcome back. Continuing to listen to the weekend edition of the KE Report. And as promised in the back two segments here, we are going to focus a little bit more on the resource space, especially when it comes to the underlying stocks, as we are chatting with Matt Geiger, managing partner at MJG Capital. Now, Matt, before we get into a focus on the resource sector, I do want to talk about the broader markets here because, look, it has been an impressive rally. This whole year, the markets have done fairly well, but it's just been in the last couple months when markets bottomed kind of at the tail end of October and have moved pretty much straight up. We have the Dow at all-time highs. The S&P is very close to all-time highs. I guess a lot of this is on the back of this whole pivot party from the Fed and locking in or at least saying that they will be cutting rates next year, even if things seem to be going pretty well. But overall, investors seem to have rotated money out of market money market funds into broad equities. Matt, what do you take away from this environment? Well, it's good to be with you, Corey. And um, man, I I, I agree with you. It's been a wild uh, six weeks in particular since right at the tail end of October, the S&P is now up over 15% over that period. And it may not seem this way to so many of the long-only listeners that may be uh, listening to this podcast, but I'm viewing this actually as a classic max pain event. And who's feeling the pain? Institutions primarily, those that that are either market neutral or, or net short the market definitely some short squeeze activity going on here. And then additionally, mom and pop investors, many of which are still heavy in terms of cash, dating all the way back to the COVID uh, shakeout in 2020. So I'd say that giant sucking sound that you hear is retail investors throwing the rest of their dry powder into equities, really in, in FOMO fashion. And uh, these, these FOMO moves, while they can, they can you know, continue with some duration, rarely end well. So I'm, I'm quite dubious by the extent of this, this move. Um, of course, Powell's comments were far more dovish than many expected. But if you looked at expectations, both the Fed's dot plot and just expectations amongst the market generally, folks were already expecting rate cuts uh, next year. Uh, maybe Powell was a bit more direct in affirming that view. You know, it's always worthy hearing it from the horse's mouth. But I, I, I personally am quite surprised by the, uh, the extent of the reaction that we saw on the back of the last Fed meeting. I mean, this does beg the question, is, is now a good time to be piling into the uh, U.S. Uh, indices in particular? And I mean, the, the answer is a resounding no, as far as I'm concerned, um, at least for those that aren't short-term momentum traders. Um, and there, there's a few factors to consider. First, the U.S. market, just looking at the U.S. market itself historically on absolute terms, uh, the Buffett indicator is, is, is one thing to look at, which is the uh, U.S. GDP relative to the combined capitalization of, of all U.S. Uh, listed equities. And we are just below all time highs. I, I will concede we're a little bit below where we were in November of 2021, but just below all time highs and way above the peak scene before the dot com bust um, or the great financial uh, crisis in 2008. So we're certainly not cheap relative to where the U.S. market has been historically. We're also not cheap relative to other asset classes. 
just look at U.S. stock markets relative to, to global indices or in even more extreme disparity is US, the U.S. stock market relative to uh, emerging equities. So those that truly feel an urge to be deploying into equities right now, there are far better places to be looking, in my opinion, uh, than, than the broader U.S. markets. And, and finally, just look at historical price behavior of U.S. markets when it comes to a Fed hike cycle. Historically, what we'll see, it's not the first hike that causes a major crash, nor is it the pause. Um, it's actually the first cut. And this has, this has occurred time and time again. So it's quite possible that it's different this time. There are no guarantees. History does not always repeat. Um, but what we're seeing here appears to mirror pretty classic behavior of, of past cycles, where the market actually rallies very strongly into the pause. And then the, the, the pain occurs when we first see the, the cut. Yeah, man, I think that's such a key point because a lot of people thought it was the hiking that was going to be the problem. But it's actually when you start cutting because it means that the Fed is seeing something under the surface where there could be economic weakness. And all, in all reality, that's what they wanted to see. And they are getting that in the real estate market and manufacturing and other sectors. But uh, when we do start seeing the cuts or just the market anticipating them and hearing it, as you say, from the horse's mouth, it has given all markets a big rally. It wasn't just the general markets. We've seen that in the cryptocurrencies. We've seen that in commodities. We've definitely seen that in precious metals. We saw gold do an about face from pulling back for all of last week to rocketing back higher again this week. What do you make of the disconnect, though, that we still see in the junior mining sector? While most of the metals and commodities are running, and that's on a weak dollar and rates continuing to pull back, we just noted before this call that the, the 10 years already pulled back down below 4% again. We haven't seen that in a while. That is helping the underlying metals, but it's not really moving the mining stocks as much. What's your lay of the land on the junior resource sector? Well, in the short term, I'm actually very bullish. I, I mean, I think it's clear that the animal spirits are out more, more generally in financial markets. And I would not be surprised at all to see a very strong rally into the new year here. And, and I think this rally could continue as long as broader financial markets remain buoyant. Now, my concern remains that the juniors will get whacked, as they always do, without fail, whenever the broader financial markets next roll over. And, and that will occur. My, my expectation is it will occur next year. Perhaps it will be longer than that. Perhaps it will be just a few months from now. But we will see another period of financial pain. And when that occurs, the juniors will get whacked. In that period in between, however, I think there's a ton of catching, catching up to do. Because as we discussed on our last call, I actually was expecting quite a bit of weakness in the junior patch this year. But with the expectations that the broader market would, would be the driver of that pain. What, what I certainly did not foresee was the juniors getting whacked to the extent that they did, while you know broader financial markets, broader equity markets uh, continue to march towards all-time highs, uh, especially as we're seeing in the United States. So I, I, I do foresee an explosive rally, some, some catching up, so to speak. I mean, we're right at the tail end of, of tax loss uh, season here. And I think that can continue until we see the next you know, major market dislocation, think the, the COVID 2020 panic or even the you know, period in Q2 and Q3 of last year when the, when the Fed hike cycle uh, began. So I've actually gotten quite a bit more aggressive than I anticipated. You know, just in September, we were, we were in double digit uh, cash positions. We're, we're now in the low single digits. Of course, if this rally does materialize, then I will look to uh, increase our cash to a more conservative uh, posture uh, with the expectation that there there will be pain um, when the when the broader markets roll roll over. Matt, what about the major stocks though? Because look at how much Newmont has moved. We're recording this about halfway through the day on Thursday, and just if you take into account the moves on Wednesday and now half of Thursday, Newmont's up almost ten percent on high volume too. How much will the juniors benefit from? Who knows? This could be a significant uptrend in the majors. Right. Well, I mean, there's if this is a, a significant uptrend in the majors, um, then we will see the trickle down effect occur. Um, that's how the strongest moves generally materialize. You need, you need a few ingredients. Uh, you need intense pain and absolutely uh, bombed out sentiment. And, and that's certainly what we what we saw in September, October, November period. And then you need the larger, more liquid names to, to lead. And if that continues for a sustainable period of time, and animal spirits remain high, you do see the trickle down into the juniors. And that's when you can see those, those explosive moves really materialize. 
Well, Matt, we've also seen on the recent uplift in metals prices and a little bit of action in the majors and a little bit of action in the sector, uh, a string of private equity and even royalty and streaming deals pop up. The capital markets are opening back up. What do you make of that? Yeah, I, I found this interesting. I mean, I wouldn't say the capital, well, some parts of the capital markets have opened up. I mean, I, I view this as private equity and the royalty and streamers really stepping in here to fill the gap left by extremely depressed uh, equity markets uh, w- within the mining space. We've, we've had a few deals of note here just in the past uh, you know, five or six trading days. The first one was gold royalty investing uh, $31 million into Aura Minerals' Borbrema project down in Brazil. To comprise a part of the the project's construction financing package, the money, however, interestingly here, is really not from Gold Royalty. I mean, they're they're technically the ones that are uh, sending sending the wires over to Aura Minerals, but Gold Royalty did not have this money on their balance sheet. Uh, concurrent with that deal being announced, uh, Aura announced um, a deal with Queens Road Capital and Australian private equity group uh, Taurus Funds Management, where those two put 40 million. Uh, into um, gold royalty in the form of of convertible debt uh, to allow them to make this transaction. So this is really money flowing from private equity uh, to Aura Minerals with gold royalty serving as an intermediary. More recently this week, we saw Orion put 80 million into Solaris Resources, presumably to get their Warrensa project in Ecuador to a construction decision or at least close to a construction decision. And this is a case of Orion doing what what they do best. They've always been comfortable offering multiple financing options, and that could be a royalty and stream, that could be an offtake agreement, that could be a senior debt arrangement, could be convertible debt, it could be equity. Well, most groups out there just hone in on one of these, so they're able to offer a suite of, uh, of financing options, you know, from one one group. I mean, in this case, it was uh, 60 million in senior debt, I believe, and 10 million in equity, and then a, t- a 10 million uh, offtake agreement uh, as well. And then uh, just this morning, uh, we're talking on Thursday, December 14th, Vista Gold announced a deal with uh, with Wheaton for its Mount Todd project, uh, where Wheaton's providing 20 million U.S. to Vista Gold uh, in exchange for a 1% gross revenue royalty over their, their project. And interestingly, as has been the case with many of Wheaton's deals in the past nine or 12 months, this deal comes with a rofer over any additional streams, royalties, or prepays that Vista applies to Mount Todd in the future. And, and Wheaton really seems to value rofers far more than its uh, you know, royalty peers um, and competitors. And they, they've even shown a willingness in recent months to stray from their or to stray from the royalty and streaming model and, and do direct equity investments uh, into companies. A couple, a couple examples are uh, Liberty Gold and, and Integra uh, as well. And in each case, they, they made this equity investment, but, but my sense was that the, the real investment or the real draw of the, the investment from Wheaton's perspective was getting a rofer in each of these cases for future royalties or streams over the given project. So that's something to note, and I don't see any other royalty, any other major royalty company out there really putting this focus on, on rofers. And I just say more generally, I, I think these deals actually serve as a bit of a contrarian indicator. You know, as I see it, the smart money clearly thinks that it's a good time to deploy as the cost of capital for equity is just so high at the moment. And I think we could see a flurry of you know similar deals with private equity and or royalty and streaming groups into the new year, unless, uh, of course, juniors rally so sharply that uh, the deal window slams you know shut in the face of these uh, royalty and streaming and, and PE groups. Um, but I, I think we do still see a few more maybe over the coming 30 to, to 60 days. Well, we all know that if the markets keep going, if these stock prices keep going, money really frees up for these companies. But Matt, talking about these private equity deals, these royalty and streaming deals, they really are stepping stones for some of these companies to hopefully get these well-established assets built. Do you think we will see more of these projects actually go into construction next year or even in the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean it's really project uh, project dependent and also also commodity uh, dependent. I mean, uh, Mount for for the three that we discussed, I mean, Warrensa is still a couple years before they can even get to the point where they could potentially press go. Aura Minerals Boberema project that that is a go. So I do think we'll we'll, we'll see first production there. Um, Mount Todd is a, is a beast of a project. So 20 million is just a drop in the bucket for what they need to actually to actually build that thing. So in the case of these of these specifics, um, we'll see. 
Yeah, more generally, you, you really have to look at the the, the price incentives. Like for, for copper, for instance, we, you know, we're trading around 360, 370 a pound. To really see the, the, the big boys press go on the next wave of, of major new copper mines, we're going to need to see 525, 550 copper, if, if not quite a bit higher. I, I think it's it's well well understood, well agreed upon within the industry that that 525 range is is where the incentive price is. But in past cycles, we've seen the the, the actual spot price of the metals need to, to go up sometimes close to twice the incentive price before the big boys really get a move on. Um, so I think particularly in the copper space, uh, there, we, we need to see some significant price moves um, before we see, you know, the next generation of mines really, really get rolling. Well, Matt, just on this topic of strategic investments or different funds coming in in the royalty space, we did see one other one of note, and uh, it was with Star Royalties announcing that Synovus Energy has taken a stake in the Green Star Royalties, which is a JV with themselves and Agnico Eagle. So this is on the carbon credit side of the royalty space. First of all, that's unique just to the royalties on carbon credits, but also it shows more money uh, coming into the royalty sector. What do you make of that deal? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite close to that, to that deal. You know, for full disclosure, Star Royalties is, our, uh, is one of our larger uh, holdings with it within the fund. And I'm, I'm, we, we've been buying in the aftermath of that, that deal. Look, I mean, it's, it's quite exciting from my perspective. Synovus, um, for those that don't know, is a $30 billion oil and gas company uh, headquartered out of uh, Calgary. And yeah, they cut a $21 million check to Star Royalty's Green Star subsidi- subsidiary. Green Star's focus specifically on carbon credit uh, royalty and stream deals. So upon this investment, Synovus now joins Agnico Eagle as the second major strategic uh, to have put money into Green Star. Agnico came in in uh, spring of 2022, uh, and so it took a took a good 18 months for Green Star to find its next major strategic investor. Um, but Synovus is coming in at a at a 50% premium to to Agnico's uh, initial investment, um, which I think caught quite a few folks by surprise, particularly given how poorly and uh, carbon market have performed um, over over the past couple of years. So each of these companies now own, both Agnico and Synovus now own uh, just under 26% of Green Star, with uh, Star Royalties owning owning the rest, around around 46%. The post-money valuation of Synovus's investment was around $82 million. So Star Royalties stake in Green Star is equivalent to $0.50 cents per Star share. This, of course, assumes that Synovus paid a fair price. Um, so there's still a pretty significant uh, disconnect between Star's current trading price and where Synovus uh, priced Green Star with this most recent uh, financing. I mean, more generally, this this does beg the question, you know, whether this deal could mark the bottom or at least some green shoots. It is what is, has been an absolutely abysmal uh, two years for anybody involved in the carbon credit space. I would say the jury is still out, but I, but I know for sure that many of Green Star's peers were actually thrilled to see this deal announced. You know, even though Green Star is technically one of their competitors, but the, the financing window for a lot of these uh, carbon credit and royalty groups that you know seem to be uh, spawning every month in 2021 has absolutely slammed shut. So these groups have largely been spinning their wheels for two years. They have a name, they have a, they have a company, most of them private, but they don't have any money to deploy. And I know one of the more credible competitors of Green Star, private competitors of Green Star got close to, to closing the financing this past summer, but the deal fell apart at the 11th hour, just given how poorly carbon markets have, have performed um, over, over the past uh, you know, 18 to 24 months. So, you know, it's, again, jury's still out, but I think this could be a sign that, at least for the more credible uh, carbon royalty and streaming operators, uh, we, we could see some more, some more capital coming in. And of course, from Green Star's perspective, I mean, this is an excellent counter-cyclical opportunity. You know, they now have $20 million to deploy into, you know, various um, options. I know they have a, a full deal pipeline um, solely focused on North America. And um, I expect they'll be, they'll be pretty active here uh, as most of their competitors just don't have the balance sheets to go out and do additional deals at the moment. Yeah, well, as you said, a lot of these companies were celebrating the deal because it is a deal that is actually happening in the carbon market after all these companies were announced uh, just over the last couple of years. But Matt, how do you even go about analyzing some of these carbon companies that they're so new and the market is it's out there, but the pricing model is confusing all these companies. It's confusing to know what even assets they have. 
how do you go about even selecting a carbon company that you're getting into? It is. And I know there's a lot of skepticism about the, the carbon credit space, and there, and there should be. I mean, it, it is truly the Wild West out there. I think one point that's worth, worth clarifying, and CEO of, uh, of Star Royalties, Alex Pernan, you know, explains this well. It's best to think of the carbon credit market as one would think of the diamond market. There is technically an, an index that called the CBL, Nature-Based Global Emission uh, Offset Index, that tries to track carbon credit prices. Um, and, and that uh, indice, interestingly, is off an astounding 95% from early 2022. Uh, it reached up close to $19 per credit. It's now sub a dollar per credit. But it's important to note, these are very low quality credits. This, these are kind of commoditized credits with, without really the ability to, to back. So it's, it's, that's not the way to look at the space. The, the credits that Star and the more credible groups are looking at literally are trading at 20 to 30x premiums to, to the credits that you see within the C CBL nature, uh, nature-based uh, index. So it's extremely important to know the project, uh, know the operators, know, know the different counterparties, and there's just a massive spread between the, the value of individual credits, just as one would see, would see within the diamond space. So I think part of the reason there's this perception of, of, of the carbon credit market absolutely being bombed out is this actual index, which is, which is really the only index that you, can, that you can follow. But that's actually, for the higher quality credits, prices have actually hung in there pretty well. So from, from Star's perspective, it's less that they're able to you know, participate in distressed deals. It's more that just the competition for these higher quality credits is very low at the moment. So that's, that's the excitement from, from their perspective. And I, I would just say, look, to the folks that are, that are skeptical on the space, again, skepticism is warranted, but look at the strategics, look at Agnico Eagle, look at this, uh, look at this oil and gas company, Synovus, you know, putting, putting their money where their, where their mouth is. You know, whether or not you even agree that global warming is a, a valid concern to be had, there is going to be tremendous demand for these credits going forward. And that's both from, you know, regulatory compliance markets um, with, with governments potentially forcing carbon credit, you know, uh, requirements on companies. I know there's some contention about that, but it'll also be in the voluntary market, you know, companies going out of their way uh, to purchase credits uh, so that they can then tell their, their customers and, 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 uh, and consumers that they're a net neutral company. And I know some folks would say, well, that's just greenwashing and that, you know, uh, you know, that that shouldn't be taken at face value. And, and maybe that's that's the case, but it's still happening either way. So I, I think we're still in the very early stages of this of this market. I hope that the past two years has served as a bit of a, a culling period, both for the new entrants that we saw come in and during the hype days of 2021 and also in terms of lower quality projects that are out there. But I do believe that those that are able to, to able to survive this period are are in actually very good very good position um, over over the coming years. So uh, this this is our only you know carbon credit focused investment. Star of course also comes with a mining royalty component as well that I would argue is you know worth between twenty to thirty cents uh, per share on its on its own right. But from my perspective, you know Star is is through and through a, a carbon credit focused investment um, with it with a nice little mining uh, kicker which is receiving no value at the moment. All right, Matt, we'll wrap it up here. Man, oh man, I find this coal carbon sector so interesting because there are so many companies that have gotten behind it, so many groups have gotten behind it. But as you said, it's kind of the wild, wild west, but any sort of big investments, that's huge. And hey, government policies, that could really be a driver behind some of these and just larger companies taking a more proactive role to, who knows, buy these companies, buy carbon credits, who knows how it's all going to play out. That's but right. Matt, Whether you agree with it or not, it's it's happening. Exactly. Well, Matt, thank you very much for your time on this weekend show. It's a great chatting with you on a pretty much monthly basis now. And remember, you can keep up to date with Matt over at the MJG Capital website, which we will link to within the weekend show posting. And everybody, thanks for tuning in on this weekend show. We hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. We will be back with some editorials throughout the week right before Christmas. So please keep up to date with us on our website, kereport.com and podcast, the KE Report. Matt, everyone listening, again, thanks for your time this weekend. Hope you all have a great rest of your weekend.